All right, so a massive amount of information was just leaked and revealed concerning Apple Silicon Max. And based on everything I'm seeing, people are vastly underestimating how good Apple Macs are about to become. So in this video, I'm gonna discuss all of these leaks, including the release date, which Macs to expect first, how much performance we can realistically expect, and how well apps are already running on the Apple Silicon Developer Transition Kit. First off, the number one major benefit to Apple Silicon Macs that people are underestimating is the fact that they'll be able to natively run iPhone and iPad apps right out of the box. And if you're struggling to figure out how that's gonna work, developer Steve Trouton Smith was able to get them working on his Apple Developer Transition Kit, which uses the A12Z chip. And so far, he's extremely impressed, so I'll be talking about that in just a minute. And by the way, Geekbench 5 Pro is now running natively on this new Mac, and that A12Z chip is getting very impressive scores. In the multi-core test, it scored 4,555 points, which beats out the fastest 10th gen i7 processor in the 2020 13-inch MacBook Pro. And it also scored 12,610 metal graphics points, which again, is faster than that same MacBook Pro was able to achieve. So the future is already looking very bright for Apple Silicon Macs. And to make it even better, 9to5Mac just revealed a major exclusive leak from the latest macOS Big Sur Beta 3 release. They've basically found a new extension with code that points to Apple Silicon Macs finally coming with Face ID. And this makes sense because Face ID requires the neural engine, which is built into the iPhone and the iPad, and Apple has already revealed that Apple Silicon Macs are gonna have the neural engine as well. So if this is true, future Macs are gonna have access to Memoji features and other augmented reality apps like Snapchat filters and things like that. Now let's move on to the leak that reveals when we should expect the first Apple Silicon Macs to be revealed. It comes from the Twitter page iHack2, which also reveals that Apple's iPhone event will be streamed online on September 8th, which includes air power and a new iPad release. But our attention for this video is Apple's October event, which should be hosted on the 27th and include a new iPad Pro and two Apple Silicon Macs, the MacBook and the 13-inch MacBook Pro. Now, I'm not exactly sure if Apple will be able to pack Face ID on those MacBooks since they're fairly thin and small, but they will be packing the very first Apple Silicon Mac chips, which will most likely be low power chips. And then next year, we should begin to see much more powerful versions of these chips on the higher end Macs, like the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Now also seeing the iPad Pro on that leaked list is a bit weird since Apple just released the 2020 iPad Pro and rumors are pointing to the new one only coming in 2021 with a mini LED display. So it would be awesome if Apple was actually able to get it done sooner than expected. And most likely, this new iPad Pro should feature the A14X chip, which is gonna be built on TSMC's new five nanometer fabrication process. And we actually have some very recent performance leaks that can help us figure out around how much performance that A14X chip will have. In the past, Apple's iPad Pro chips were basically more powerful versions of their iPhone chips. For example, the A10X chip in the 2017 iPad Pro was about 61% more powerful than the A10 chip in the iPhone 7 in terms of Geekbench 5's multi-core CPU test. And then interestingly, the A12 chip in the iPhone XS actually outperformed the A10X in the iPad Pro. And then the A12X chip in the 2018 iPad Pro was about 71% more powerful than the A12 chip in the iPhone, with a score of 4,606 points. And now we recently saw some leaked benchmarks of the A14 chip, which is coming in this year's iPhone 12, and it was able to achieve a score of 4,612 points, which yet again, surprisingly beats the previous iPad Pro score. This basically shows us a trend in the difference between the iPhone chips and the iPad Pro chips, with around 61 to 71% more performance. 
So if we stick to a conservative 60% improvement coming from the leaked A14 chip score and apply it to the A14X that we're expecting in the upcoming iPad Pro, then that gives us a massive multi-core score of 7,379 points. This would mean that the upcoming iPad Pro with that A14X chip could outperform the best 8-core i9-9980HK processor in the 16-inch MacBook Pro, which scores around 6,955 points. Now, while this might sound totally insane, you need to keep this in mind. That i9 chip is built using Intel's 14 nanometer fabrication process, which actually compares pretty closely to TSMC's 10 nanometer process. But you need to realize that the A14X chip in the iPad Pro is going to be built using TSMC's brand new 5 nanometer process. So it's going to be a lot more efficient and it's going to run cooler than the i9. And now hold on to your seats because it's about to get a whole lot better. That i9 chip has a TDP of 45 watts. So let's go ahead and try and figure out how much the A14X will have. The A10X chip in the 2017 iPad Pro has a TDP of 8 watts. The A12X chip in the 2018 iPad Pro has a TDP of 15 watts. So there was an increase of 7 watts TDP to go from 2268 multi-core score to a massive 4606. So if we assume that the A14X chip built on the new 5 nanometer process will jump up by the same 7 watts TDP, then we can expect it to have a TDP of 22 watts or maybe up to 25 watts just to give it a little bit of wiggle room. Now we have the 22 to 25 watt TDP A14X chip outperforming the best 45 watt Intel i9 chip in the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which is absolutely insane. And it doesn't even end there, because keep in mind, Apple said that their new Apple Silicon Macs are going to come with a brand new family of chips, so they won't be using the A14X. Now why would they do this? Well, these new chips are going to be going into Macs that have active fan cooling systems. This means that Apple can design the chips with higher TDPs. So imagine if they scale the A14X chip with more cores so that it brings up the TDP up from around 22 to 25 watts all the way up to around 35 to 40 watts. This would lead to even more performance while still not being quite as hot as Intel's current 45 watt chips. Now, of course, Apple doesn't have to go all out like this, but they theoretically can. And in my personal opinion, it makes sense to do this because they need as much attention as they can get, since there are a lot of people doubting the switch to Apple Silicon. And to make all of this even better, Apple chip supplier TSMC is already on their way to having mass production of their even better 3 nanometer chips, which will be shipping in Apple devices in 2022 which is ironic because Intel literally just delayed their 7 nanometer chips until 2022 or even 2023, causing their stock price to tank by 16% today. And to add salt to Intel's wounds, TSMC stock is now up 11% today. And if all of this doesn't make you excited for Apple Silicon Macs, let's now move on to what some developers have to say about them like the Twitter user Steve Troughton Smith, who says iOS and iPad apps are fully working in Beta 3 of macOS Big Sur. He mentioned that there are a series of compatibility behaviors applied to iOS apps running unmodified on macOS, making them a lot more likely to work out of the box. He also mentioned that some previously missing deprecated frameworks like OpenGL ES are now back in macOS, so a lot of iOS apps should simply just work. He also said that full screen iPad apps can now be resized between landscape and portrait sizes just fine with no broken layouts. He then said that it was fascinating to see apps running totally unmodified, even with huge dependencies. He showed off Procreate Pocket working just fine, and the same for Spotify and Slack running perfectly. And yes, the YouTube app and Google Maps were working as intended. 
The only downside he mentioned is that developers can opt out of running their apps on macOS, so there's a chance we might not see every single app we want on Apple Silicon Macs. He also showed off coding apps like Prompt, Continuous, and Pythonista running just fine. He then mentioned that the iPad version of Pages works perhaps a little too well, with new features like multiple windows and Open Recent working as is. He showed off an iPad chess game working great on macOS and a more complex app, Adobe Draw, working just fine as well. He got Overcast to work and mentioned that it'll be allowed to resize the app to arbitrary window sizes. And as far as other developers, Hopper should now fully support Apple Silicon Macs. And 9to5Mac was apparently able to get Instagram running just fine on their developer transition kit. There are also a number of new code that's now available for macOS, like on open URL, a new placeholder Swift UI API, which is apparently really good, and a new optional alternate view controller tree for the split view controller code. And apparently, all of this new code is gonna improve apps on iOS and iPadOS 14 as well. So basically, the point that I'm trying to make is that all of these iOS and iPadOS apps are already running on a Mac while being completely unmodified using a beta version of macOS and on Apple's developer transition kit. Now imagine how it's gonna run when everything is finally released and developers have more time to optimize their apps to prepare for this. And as far as developers modifying their apps for Apple Silicon, Apple literally just released a brand new tutorial series this morning, which helps developers build a native Mac app from the same code base as an iPad app. This tutorial goes through things like sidebar navigation, toolbar actions, and UI refinements. And Steve shouted out that this is exactly what Catalyst developers needed last year. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that the future of the Mac is looking really bright right now. And I have a feeling that a lot of people are gonna be blown away at Apple's October 27th event when they finally reveal their very first Apple Silicon Macs and give us more details on how everything is gonna work. So hopefully you learned something new from this video. And if you did, go ahead and tap the like button and click the circle above to subscribe. Be sure to check out our Apple product hoodie down below. And if you're interested in seeing how gaming is gonna work on these new Macs, definitely watch the video right over there. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.